Welcome, and thank you for joining us tonight for the panel discussion, Sarah Lucas, uh, for the, about Sarah Lucas's exhibition at the National Gallery of Australia. My name is Peter Johnson, and I'm the curator of projects here. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which I'm coming to you tonight, the, and the traditional custodians, the Nambri and the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd like to extend that respect to all the First Nations people joining us tonight. I am a man in my 30s, a white man um, with middle length brown hair, a fringe I've been cultivating over lockdown, which I'm still not sure about, uh, in a blue jacket and a blue shirt. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, that was a self description and we'll be asking the other panelists to do that as well uh, for the blind and vision impaired audiences joining us tonight. Tonight's panel um, is being supported by the British Council as part of their UK Australia season, and we'd like to extend their, uh, our thanks for their support. The impetus for this panel discussion is, of course, Sarah Lucas and the exhibition Project One, Sarah Lucas, that's currently on at the National Gallery. We've been really thrilled to bring the work of Sarah Lucas to Australia for her first solo exhibition um, in this country. Sarah has become one of the UK's leading artists in her practice over the last 30 years, and indeed one of the world's leading artists. Uh, she, through her you know, amazing use of humour, she's able to talk about really difficult things like misogyny and objectification, mortality, and our relationships with our bodies. This show, which you can see behind me, is on until uh, Easter 2022, the 18th of April. So I hope you all have a chance to come and see it before then. Um, it brings together 10 new works, 10 sculptures, five of them in bronze and five of her bunnies in made from stockings and stuffed with wool, surrounded by seven and a half metre high photographs, self-portraits that she took in 1990. Uh, where she's eating a banana and staring right down the barrel of the camera, returning the viewer's gaze. This exhibition is the first in the National Gallery's project series, which presents new works by contemporary artists. It's also part of Know My Name, a series of ongoing gender equity initiatives by the gallery to increase the representation of women in artistic programs, collection development and organisational structures. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce a really exciting panel to discuss Sarah's work and indeed their own works as well. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing Emma Dexter. Emma Dexter has been the Director of Visual Arts at the British Council since 2014, with oversight of the British Council collection, as well as being the Commissioner of the British Pavilion for the Venice Art Biennale, overseeing in this time the selection of, selection of Sonia Boyce, OBE, to represent the UK in 2022, Kathy Wilkes in 2019, and Dame Phila de Barlow in 2017. Before joining the British Council, Dexter had a curatorial career in a wide range of UK visual artists, uh, arts organisations, including Tate Modern and London's Institute of Contemporary Art. And I'd now like to invite Emma to self-describe. I am a 60-year-old um, woman sitting in my study in South London as the dawn comes up and I have a blue background in my room and I have short, dark hair, I wear glasses and I'm wearing a tweed jacket. Thanks, Emma. I'd now like to introduce Michaela Dwyer who's joining us from the lands of the Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation in Nam, Melbourne. Dwyer has been exhibiting internationally since 1982 with works that explore how we relate to the object world. She's pushed the limits of sculpture, painting and performance, establishing herself as one of Australia's most important contemporary artists. A major survey exhibition, Makala Dwyer, A Shape of Thought, was held at the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney in 2017 and 2018. She's currently Associate Professor of Fine Arts at RMIT University in Melbourne and represented by Roslyn Oxley Nine Gallery. Over to you, Michaela. Um, hi. Um, so I'm also a, well, 62-year-old woman. I'm white. I have really bad 
lockdown hair that needs a haircut desperately and it's sort of white and black and the roots have really grown out. And I'm sitting in um, my apartment, which is really messy, but you can't see that because I've got the camera pointing at the tidy end of the corner. And I've got some artworks behind me that are, one is by Madison Bycroft. It's a beautiful silk hanging of a kind of strange creature, god, goddess behind me, and a wooden carving by um, the artist Baluka Maimaru from Yakala, which is a, a, a small kind of figure sculpture, and another kind of long, skinny red wax sculpture that's by um, the artist Fionn Bachelor. And, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Michaela. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Natalia Hughes, joining us from the lands of the Jagera peoples in Mianjin, Brisbane. Hughes's practice is concerned with decorative and ornamental traditions and their associations with the feminine, the body and excess. Recent bodies of work investigate the relationship between modernist painters and their anonymous women subjects. Hughes won the Sunshine Coast Art Prize in 2020 and was a finalist in the Sulman Prize at the Art Gallery of New South Wales in 2018, as well as the 2017 Ramsey Art Prize at the Art Gallery of South Australia. Her work has been included in institutional exhibitions at Quagoma, Art Space in Sydney and the Ian Potter Museum of Art in Melbourne. She's currently the Program Director of Honours Visual Arts at the Queensland College of the Arts. She is represented by Milani Gallery in Brisbane and Sullivan and Strumpf in Sydney. Over to you, Natalia. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm a 44-year-old woman, um, quite pale skin, but maybe a little red today because it's quite hot in Brisbane. I have shoulder-length shaggy curly hair and I'm sitting in my studio, so to the right are some unfinished paintings in the background and to the left is an unfinished rug. Um, yeah, floating around. Thanks. Thank you. I think we should just get straight into it because I, you know, tonight I really just want to hear from you about your practices and, and how they sort of intersect at different points with the, the work of Sarah Lucas. For me, um, the, the thing that I think of first when I think of Sarah is her sense of humour and the humour in the works. Um, when I interviewed her um, in preparation for this exhibition, uh, her response was, and I would like to read it out because I think it's really interesting. She says, when humour happens, things get good, less depressing. It's a kind of magic. Suddenly things make sense. Contradictory things, hard to reconcile things. The same as jokes, really, or Freudian slips. Um, Emma, you know, in, in preparation for this, we talked about the fact that Sarah Lucas is the master of the one-liner um, yet she definitely ensures that her work never feels one-dimensional or trite. So how does that humour play out in her work and, and what effect does it have? Um, I mean, I think, for me, the, the, a, a key word that I keep coming back to when I think about her work is play and playfulness and 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 how, I mean, obviously that's a really important element in, in any artist's uh, or any successful artist's work is the way that she uses um, language, phrases that are just knocking around in her head um, and often repetition, sort of visual puns, uh, um, literal puns, jokes um, that play within within an exhibition. So a huge amount of interrelation of, um, of, of materials and colours and repetition, um, but, but all interlaced together. So I suppose for me, um, I mean, just thinking about the whole question of humour, I think when, when um, Sarah sort of um, arrived on the scene in, in London and, and obviously her her fellows who were sort of part of that uh, sort of goldsmith's moment in the early 90s um, who sort of burst onto the scene. Obviously, there was a, a sense of breaking with the old order. And I, I think probably perhaps a lot of work that was made in London um, and, and 
at, uh, in the previous decade was probably very serious and rather po-faced. And so it did seem very radical and, uh, and destabilizing for artists, particularly uh, Sarah, to be using humour to really sort of upset, uh, upset the apple cart, um, obviously sort of upset patriarchy. Also, was it also quite threatening to the establishment and that establishment art world um, because of its humour? I'm sure there was, there's often quite a lot of snobbery associated with humour in art, that it's somehow less valuable, that it's not so serious. Um, and I, you know, I was just thinking there was a sort of radical accessibility about how Sarah operates and puts work together and the fact that because of all the play and interplay between objects and materials and repetitions and and sort of in jokes and ambiguity as to meaning when she's using certain titles etc there's always something to go back to and there's always something to discover and I suppose for me that's a wonderful gift to the viewer but there's also something profoundly kind of democratic about it because it talks about the it talks about the speech of everyday life um, and it speaks about the street and so I, I I love what feels like it's sort of radical accessibility. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more, and I think for me the importance of that humour is it's it's disarming as well. It allows her to talk about different things and, you know, sort of get one foot in the door. Makala, there's a lot of uh, often subtle, sometimes not subtle humour uh, in your work. I'm thinking, you know, particularly in the meeting of unexpected objects, but also in the costumes and performances uh, that you've created. Um, what draws you to this approach? Um, is it the same sort of things as Sarah, do you think? Or is it a, and we can see here, a recent or 2013 performance, Golden Bender is currently screening. So um, I'm not trying to be funny. I, I, it's often by accident. Like it's, I mean, this is, this could be that Golden Bender one was quite serious, <laughs> but um, it ended up being funny. If I try to make something funny, it ends up really tragic and serious. And if I try to make something tragic and serious, it ends up really funny so I don't it's not something I can control really and <laughs> um, that's yeah you know, that's yeah it's interesting where where you know where humor is found and sometimes that's in unexpected um unexpected yeah. places but I do like what um Emma was saying about the radicality of uh, humor and um it's ac accessibility and it's and what you you mentioned this word disarming which I think is really so true about um, if, if something funny happens, you are, it, it is a break with a, with a sense of order. It's a kind of, um, it is disarming. It's a, and it, in that way, it, it is like from some fixed order. You can't, if, you, if you're laughing, you can't, you know, there's a sort of a, a release of control or order or something, which um, I think is really interesting with it's hard, very hard to do, get humour. And it's very unfunny analysing it, I think. <laughs> um, and yet we find ourselves here. <laughs> um, Natalia, I was going to ask, you know, I think that humour is often a part of your work as well. I, you know, I think about the beautifully decorated canvases that you've created that are resting on the golden dildos. Um, do you find that humour makes it dif uh, easier to talk about difficult things or what attracts you to that? Yeah, it definitely makes it easier. I think um, the thing that I associate with humour is um, just how it's a coping mechanism for something a bit uncomfortable. Like we're used to responding to an uncomfortable situation. Like I, f I fell terribly the other day. I fell down and I swore but then... I sort of sat there laughing. I guess that's the interruption Michaela's talking about as well, um, just to, like, you know, reset and uh, find a way to get up and keep going. So I, I think, um, yeah, it makes things that are maybe a little bit hard to swallow, a little bit unpalatable, um, possible to, you know, take in. Um, I like that about it. 
um, yeah, it's uh, things become, I don't know, sometimes it's a way of taking something that might otherwise be a little bit offensive and making it, um, I don't know, um, I don't want to say it negates what's uncomfortable about it, um, but it just provides some sweetener to engage with that thing that might be otherwise taken as offensive. <laughs> No, ab absolutely. And I think that probably leads on to the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is, I guess, what, to my mind, Sarah Lucas is using that humour to talk about, which is, you know, by and large, misogyny. It's about the objectification of women, um, whether that be in popular culture. Obviously, her, her series of soft sculptures, the bunnies, named after Playboy bunnies. But there's probably a, a, there's almost, there's absolutely a legacy there as well of depictions of women in um, in art history, particularly in sort of that North American and European art history. Um, there's an interesting quote from Sarah when she was asked about uh, how she, deal, how she you know, she's dealing with these sort of quite serious issues that her works raise. And she said, I'm not trying to solve the problem. I'm exploring the moral dilemma by incorporating it, um, which I think is easy and it's interesting. And you can see that in the work that they're, not necessarily activist, uh, but they are raising the issues. Natalia, your recent body of work explicitly considers the legacy of modernist painter uh, Willem de Kooning's women's series, uh, several of which are exhibited here at the gallery as part of Know My Name. And I should mention that Makala also has work exhibited here as part of Know My Name, which is really exciting. Um, what drew you to this lineage, this legacy, um, and how does it relate to women and their bodies and how they're treated more broadly? Um, I guess it's just an extension of something that I've been doing more broadly. Like I really did um, hone in on de Kooning, maybe unfairly, but um, I've always been quite interested in the way women are represented in art history and um, especially uh, which kind of canonical works explore this theme as if... Um, you know, the theme of the female form, this particular abstraction. Um, and de Kooning was kind of exemplary <laughs> as a figure who had done that, um, especially because he didn't name um, particular women in the work. It was woman one, woman two, woman three, woman four, woman five. So, um, yeah, I guess I was kind of uh, in part at work because initially I hated them, um, so that's a good reason to spend four years of your life engaging with them. Um, but I was also trying to understand the appeal, understand the process, understand, uh, you know, the way um, he worked um, and to take a little bit of it back um, as not just um, the subject but also the person making the work. So um, in some ways he's a bit of an easy target um, I thought. Uh, I know better now, having engaged with them more closely, but um, it just seemed like a place that uh, had a lot of potential for sort of thinking through that theme of um, representation of women in particular. So that's why I came to it. Um, and he's still kind of hanging around the studio a little bit, even though I've moved on to another artist. But, um, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure... Um, I get asked all the time whether I like him or not. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people kind of saw the show and 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 hadn't quite figured out, you know, if you do a, if you appropriate a decoding image and then you spend all this time kind of refiguring it using this decorative language and then you plop it on some um, gold double-ended dildos, like whether that equates to me loving the artist so much that I had to have another goal of it or whether I'm critical and um, I definitely err on the side of critical of certain aspects but then I've learned to have an appreciation of certain others. Um, certainly wanted to change the tone of them and that's where humour was important, um, I think. Yeah, because I was, as we were preparing for this exhibition, uh, Woman 5, which from that series is, is in the National Collection and I, I spent some time with it and mm -hmm. it was interesting to think about the sort of the violence inherent in those works and the way that women's bodies are cut up and, and the picture plane is distorted and the abstraction, um, you know, emphasises the breasts and sort of, but also sort of obscures her identity. But then also thinking about the violence in some of Sarah's figures. And I think 
you know, they're perhaps doing very different work. Yeah, I don't know if I would ever describe Sarah's figures as um, as doing violence to the body because they're so, um, I don't know, that the, the absurdity, the way it's pushed into an area of humour, um, I don't know, for some reason... I see it as a different process, even though, you know, there's like multiple body forms and they're piled on top of each other and the, the, the twisting and contorting and then they're squeezed into these completely unreasonable shoes. It's kind of um, seems to me to be motivated by something at a completely different end. Like I, I think, um, and I think I said this to you when we talked last time, I kind of have more empathy necessarily for the bunnies than I would a cocooning woman um, who's sort of, you know, looming and a little bit grotesque and, and terrifying in some ways. These uh, are not so terrifying. I just kind of um, I feel for them <laughs> in a particular way. Um, Emma, I was wondering, I think I mentioned this before, do you, do you see Sarah's work as being feminist or activist or is it dealing with misogyny in a different way? Um, and how do her works relate to that long history of men depicting women in art history? Well, I think, um, I mean, from what I can tell from interviews that I've read of, from Sarah and, and, and knowing her a little bit, um, she's not terribly keen on labels. Um, I, I just think, and I think that's, you know, I think that's very freeing as well because, as we know, labels are ways of putting people in boxes and I think she's obviously... She's been very smart, I suppose, in the way that she has created a particular identity for herself. Um, but it does nothing about it feels forced. Um, her self-image is that of an artist, first and foremost. And, and that's, uh, you know, that in itself, sadly, is quite a potent thing to, to do. Um, uh, and the fact, you know, that she, I think it's all about context. You know, when you first see, um, when you, when, when I first saw those, um, those sort of tabloid spread collages in the city racing show, Penis Nailed to a Board back in 1992, I was really disturbed and confused by them. And I, I imagine I was probably quite a po-faced young curator at the time, and I didn't really understand what Sarah was doing. Um, and what she was doing was this really sort of classic Duchampian move of putting those images um, and, and, and those texts in that gallery and getting you to see them for real. And the fact that they were blown up so large, I, mean, that I was really horrified by them. And, and still remember that to this day um and I I was very conf I have to admit I was very confused by the exhibition and I didn't really get it um which is my failing not not Sarah's um but I talked about it I went I took photographs of the show and I talked to a group of students I was doing a talk at, at Winchester Art Gallery and I talked about that show in depth I think as a way of trying to work out what it was and knowing that there was something really important going on there. Um, so I liked the way that she doesn't, there isn't anything at all um, preachy or, or um, sort of pedagogic about her work. It's still very open for you to make up your own mind about what you're seeing and what it means and where you fit into it. And obviously for women, sometimes that can be quite uncomfortable when you recognise things about the world that make life difficult reflected in her work. Um, um, as Natalia was saying about how you feel when you look at the bunnies squeezed into those shoes um, and in those positions, um, and there's a strange sort of identification that happens with that, I think, if you're a woman looking at those those forms. Um, so I don't know whether I've really answered your question, Peter, um, about feminism, but um, 
I think, um, yeah, I've probably said enough. <laughs> I think just, uh, no, that was fantastic. Thank you. I think the only, um, I, when we were talking previously, I was really interested in particularly the comparison you made between so those classical busts and the busts that um, Sarah did for Venice and how she is referencing this really rich and long art history, or at least playing with it in her work as well. Um, yes, I mean, she, 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 um, that was a very classical show. And I suppose, you know, she, it, it, it riffed off the very classical architecture of the building itself. It was a remarkable um, total work of art and the way that she's using sort of ordinary furniture um, as plinths um, and being so, um, I mean, I, I, again, there's always so much to go back to in her work. So the idea that she took away the bust, which is the sort of classical um, statuary, statuary that we're so familiar with, and replaced it with bottoms or whatever you want to call them, bottom halves of figures. And yet somehow as, as, through the use of the cigarettes, et cetera, used, used bottoms as faces, et cetera. But actually because of the sort of classical echoes of it, the monochrome nature of it, the fact that it was that that it was all um, um in a sense very pure. Um, again that's that's really disarming and and I think it, that's wonderful that she's able, she's so free to make references to classical sculpture in that way, which of course um has object objectified women. But um, she talks also about the show as being um, like sort of floating meringues um, in a sea of custard as well. I mean, you know, there were so many things going on at the same time. Um, her culinary references, her references to food. So um, I think, again, it's just just shows how multi-layered everything is, everything from, from Greek classical sculpture and um, and that history um, right up to, you know, food, which clearly is a really important part of her life. Fantastic. And Makala, your work actually often eschews direct representation of the body. It's more often implied through the, you know, choices of materials or, the, you know, the particular way in which objects are arra arranged. Um, how do you relate to the representation of bodies in Sarah's work and the way that it challenges the male gaze? Does that work for you or, yeah, how, how yeah. No, no, yeah, no, I, I guess I really, um, yeah, I feel like, yeah, she's, I really sort of have been working with similar materials and furniture as Sarah a lot too, except I sort of, I guess I um, imply the figure to keep a kind of a space where you can enter it, she, where she occupies it with the figures. But what's I find it really interesting because her she's so focused, like the play and the materiality and the furniture, like she's and the one liner. It's you know they're very focused um, in their you know there's a sort of precision to this work that I'm not so good at. Like she's really like. You can identify it and feel it, and because these materials have great proximity to the body, so we are able to transfer into them very easily. You know, the chair is, you know, a stand-in for a body. It's easy to, for us to sort of sit into it, but it's already occupied by this figure. But this figure is wearing stuffed stockings. I mean, the stockings are skin. They stand in for skin for all of us. Well, certain colours of skin, I guess, and. I don't know, it's the way we inhabit these sculptures I find curious, whereas I, I'm so, I think I'm more, there's a figurative element in my work, but it's more architectural and spatial, but it's, it's a conflation of the sort of architecture and the furniture and the figure, whereas I think there's a more focus on, the, on something else in Sarah's 
Like I really enjoy the way she uses these sort of modernist furnitures for as plinths and you know, it sort of highlights the and, and the way that the bodies are so kind of elasticated and um, flexible and perky and droopy at the same time that, you know, there's a real defiance there and, and that play is really radical. Like play is very serious and it's a kind of quite a political tool, I think, um, that she can employ, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this, but, I, yeah, I find there's a real focus and precision in her work and also just bloody good sculptural form. Like, they're really beautifully, she really knows how to work as a sculptor. Like, they're just, you know, it's not, it's about it's about all sorts of really complex things, traditions and histories of sculpture that she totally gets and she's able to just, you know, very lightly kind of muck around with it. But it comes back to being really good form, <laughs> you know, but it's it, there's a whole lot of things there that are at play and um, she's sort of messing with at the same time. But, yeah, yeah. They're, they're really, that you're right, they're really satisfying in space uh, in the way that they move and as you move around the object. Yeah. Um, which one of, one of the other things I wanted to talk about was... Um, the way that difficult works, and you know, some of Sarah's works can be a bit difficult and um, are received in, potentially in different parts of the world or at different times. Um, in terms of the, the show here at the National Gallery, overwhelmingly, um, you know, it's been really positive. People have really loved the work, particularly when they've gotten to spend time with them in the space. But there has been, a, you know, a small cohort who I think find the works confronting, perhaps even offensive to begin with. Um, so I'm interested in that reception, whether that's, you know, in Australia versus the UK. Um, and Michaela, I know you spent some time in the UK in the 1980s, particularly when, you know, when the young British artists were just starting to come into their own. And you've obviously exhibited in many places around the world. Have you noticed a difference between how your work is re received here and overseas? Um. Yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know where to start with that. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I don't quite know how to answer that. Yeah, so it's different anywhere you go. It's always different. It um, in Britain when I was living there. I, yeah, it was the deep dark Thatcher years, and um, it was just really hard. And yeah, being Australian, you never go down too well in Britain, and. You know, I, I found it really complicated and I'm sorry, Emma. I, I'm a bit, a bit traumatised by my time in England. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. Well, it was a bad time, you know. It was the 80s was, you know, it wasn't a good time in London at that time. But, I mean, I, yeah. I don't know where am I going with that. What did you want to know? Was it a different reception? Yeah. I guess. I guess the question I'm interested in, maybe open it up to Natalia and Emma as well, is that you know that line which we've talked about humour, but also that line between what can be offensive and what can be delightful. So you know when you encounter these sculptures, for some people, you know the the female anatomy and the way that that multiplies or the way that it's is really confronting. But for others, I mean, I find their fallibility quite endearing I, you know I love spending time down in the show um, with the bunnies but I I guess I'm interested in how um, good work and often good artwork can be confronting to begin with yeah uh, sorry <laughs> I don't I, know, did, did you have any thoughts Natalia I do because, like, I don't. Un I, did, I I find it hard to understand the response of offence because, like, you know, like I'm thinking about certain traditions of the nude that, like, everyone's fine with, and I can't, I can't quite understand why this is not okay, <laughs> and and that's totally fine. Like, I, I don't really get it. I will say that um the other thing that I um, really love about Sarah Lucas's work at the moment in a teaching capacity is that um I have like 
I teach like a whole generation of younger women who find the idea of feminism quite offensive, but they can deal with Sarah Lucas. So they find like a certain range of body practices really hard to deal with and then they find Sarah Lucas like a way in. Um, So there's something about the offensive um, there that I kind of I feel like she, um, um, what's the word when you put down your weapons, um, disarms <laughs> in a way. So, yeah, I don't, I haven't, um, yeah, I just, I find it hard to see why someone would find this unacceptable and like Le Demoiselle de Avignon, totally cool. But <laughs> maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe I got raised differently or something. <laughs> it's always, I'm always surprised by, Um, you know, on the one hand, people kind of treat art as if it's uh, impotent and has no use. And then on the other hand, they're like Mm -hmm. deeply offended by a squishy set of stockings shoved into a pair of, um, you know, high heels. Um, I I think it's quite visceral uh, Mm -hmm. as well. I think that's probably where people might be unsettled um, quite unconsciously. It's there's Mm -hmm. something quite disturbing about the squishiness of of the um of stuffed stockings um and and sort of contortions yeah I think it's it's almost just on the basic level of a kind of awkwardness of conjunction of materials that just um I don't know brings mm. brings goosebumps out in the viewer or something I think it's it's at a very kind of primitive level that we react to sculpture and objects in a very different way to how I think we react to paintings and, and sort of flat work personally. Mm, I'm sure that that's true. I also think, it, you know, offence is something that's temporal, like it's not always the same. Offence can is a shifting kind of um, reaction, I think. Like I think also that offence might have been earlier about works that weren't finished properly, you know, like there were... If, you know, sort of uh, made out of stockings. Was a, it wasn't the objects that were offensive, it was the materials that were offensive. Or so you can't make a, you know, and then what's funny then is then Sarah goes and makes them in bronze and um, I find that really funny. Like, you know, I, I, if, if you're talking about fence, like it wasn't so much the sort of the tits and the dicks and everything everywhere. It was more like, oh, you know, that's in an art gallery and that's just made with crappy old stockings. It's not, Mm. you know, it's a combination of things. It's not any one thing. It's sort of touching a lot of buttons that, yeah, call that art kind of thing. Mm. My four-year-old could do that, I think. But it's all those sort of like a chair with, you know, and cigarette butts and things like that. Is that... What, which part of it is offensive? There's a whole kind of constellation of things that are triggering people's reactions, I think. Um, that, yeah, I totally I agree. And I think it's, there's, also a, there's also a question about who's being offended and maybe that's not a bad thing all of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I would just encourage all of our viewers out there, if you've got any, we'll move to Q&A soon. If you've got any questions for our amazing panellists, please send them through on the platform um, that you're viewing this on and, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, I just wanted to ask before we move on to q and I wanted to dig down into that question of materiality a little bit more, like into Sarah's use, particularly of, of found objects, of everyday objects. Um, and she talks about using them because they're, you know, they are the vernacular of the everyday, but they're, all, they're already imbued with some sort of content with her, with some sort of, of meaning. Um, Makala, I'd love to go to you first again, because I think there's some amazing and interesting both sympathies and differences between the way that uh, you and Sarah have used everyday objects, things like cigarette butts, uh, things like stockings and and found objects. Um, And so what what is the appeal of those materials for you? And and When I, you know, I think it's like any artist of any time, you know, you work with what is available and I was working with what I could afford, I could find, what I could do, you know. Well, there weren't slab, slabs of marble just ready there to chip away at. You know, I couldn't afford that. I didn't have the facilities. It's like a lot of artists now working, I guess, on, you know, with 
NFT or Instagram because that's what they're available, what's been available during lockdown or something, or videos more able to be transferred. It's you make work of of your times, I guess. And for me, the you know, like the materials and the ready made and found things like cigarette butts, stockings, chunk, whatever. They were things that yeah, they had the a great sort of um, vocabulary of, um, you know, they were accessible. Everybody understands what those things are. So you can employ them in a way that they can become very evocative in um, a kind of a poetry, I guess, of the everyday of talking. Yeah, I don't know. They're just um, the things that present themselves, like, yeah, at, at any given time, what's available. Well, I and, guess uh, yeah, I think particularly about the installation that was here recently of yours um, that had the, the you know the found objects in um, the stockings, and hopefully we can grab an image of that. Um, but there's yeah, I think we've, we've sort of talked about this. There's this implication of flesh, but there's something and pendulous and about yeah. the materiality of it as well. I guess I was yeah. I mean, I was always interested in architecture and architectural theory and stuff in the way that. You know, there's always this emphasis on these big buildings and the way architectures are very bossy and they can dictate the way we move through space and the way we develop psychologically and as you know and all that. But I was thinking, well, what happens in a domestic space is when people can really subvert the nature of an architect's intention by, you know, the tacky ornaments you might want to place around or the shell, the bad shelving you choose to put up or the sort of terrible coloured carpet. The way you can really mess with the sort of um, the authoritarian nature of architecture by interior decoration, I guess. So sort of interested in the, you know, the the power of objects to, to change space in a way. And, and Yeah. And I, Natalia, I guess there's something interesting having looked at your practice, whereas, you know, for the last few years, um, this move towards a really, you know, you, you know using... Uh, decorative prints from the 50s and 60s and this move towards um, questions around gender and power and representation through um, decoration. But some of your earlier work is really, you know, you use, there's a work that uses a mattress that couldn't help but make me think of Sarah's work, Au Naturel, that also uses uh, a mattress for a slightly different effect. Um, but, you know, these soft forms. So I'm just, I'm interested in that journey for you away from these more organic found sort of objects to um, what you're doing these days? Yeah, I still do try to use uh, especially decor, items of decor. I'm, I'm still very invested in using those. I, I guess um, I want in particular those mattresses were a good way of bridging everyday life and a kind of particular tradition of painting and making that tradition of painting kind of a little bit sleazy. So I, I think I'm um, what Michaela said about what's available and um, what it brings. So these kind of discrete ob objects always bring something um, new to a particular, I don't know, you bring them into a scene and then they they come, um, what comes with them is a certain range of associations that um, can be very useful um, if you're talking about painting to kind of... Um, to just drop in there. Um, yeah, I still, you know, like squishy stuff, and this is one of the reasons why I think I love the bunnies, um, the squishy stuff <laughs> that we have around us is like always hovering around my studio in different forms no matter what. So I haven't kind of left it behind, but I guess it just gets deployed in different ways. Um, I have a, um, at that time that I made the mattress works, too. I don't know if there was a bed bugs outbreak in Sydney, but there were just mattresses leaning against fences everywhere um, all the time. Um, I don't think hard rubbish gets collected anymore, but it was like at a time when you could put your mattress out on the street and the council would come and collect it. So, yeah, I was just trying to map that everyday experience to something that might happen in the gallery. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, I guess, Emma, ask you from, I guess, a more art history sort of point of view that obviously, you know, the ready-made um, has a really long history in modern art. Um, 
and even, you know, Sarah's use of, of food, as I think you've mentioned previously. But I think uh, for me, she's doing something really different with those everyday materials than perhaps, you know, Duchamp's bicycle wheel or something like that. Um, I mean, I was thinking about eggs um, and her use of eggs, which she sort of uh, used consistently throughout her practice, um, that self-portrait of her um, with fried eggs, which is quite an early work, which we've got in our collection and which has been travelled all around the world um, and, and is much in demand. Um, and we've got about 15 um, works in our collection by Sarah. And and just thinking about how, um, you know, that pose, it's such a brazen position with her legs apart and um, it's a traditional kind of street cat call from men to women who are not, who are quite flat chested um, to shout out to fried eggs. And um, so she's sort of brazenly sitting there with two fried eggs on her chest with her legs apart saying kind of gotcha <laughs> um, to those. I, so for me, it's a sort of, it's such a wonderfully empowering image of such a repost to um, to the world of the street and and you know what you what you face, but also again humorous, very jocular, absurd, uh, um, and then you know then she car- then she carries on with egg massages and and again. Um, meringues and custard um, in in the show that she did um, in the British Pavilion in um, in in 2015. So um, eggs, of course, everywhere, completely ubiquitous, but sort of overlooked. Um, and um, and yet, obviously, um, relates very strongly to to the nature of, of woman um, and the nature of humanity. So sort of operating on so many different levels um, just through using one extraordinary natural object. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of, it can be mined endlessly, I think, um, by her. Absolutely. And I think um, for me, her use of food more, broadly is really interesting and sort of the last topic that I wanted to come to was this uh, idea of abjection um, which you know popularized by Julia Kristeva but this idea of um, the sort of existential horror you feel when you're confronted by the difference between the self and the other it's the the feeling of looking at a corpse Um, and you know often in a lot of artworks it's characterized by bodily fluids or, um, you know, grotesque bodies. So I think there's there's something in that vein in Sarah's work, particularly in her use of uh, food. You know, we can see chicken knickers on the screen at the moment, um, which is, I think, one of my favourite works. Uh, reminds me in, a, in an excellent way of uh, Courbet's Origin of the World, which I don't think we could show you tonight. Um, but I guess I was interested, Michaela, about... Um, your relationship with the abject. And I'm thinking as well, again, about that 2013 performance, um, Golden Golden Bender. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's, um, I don't know, I was walking along on a sunny day and just thought that, you know, I want to get a group of ballet dancers to do a communal shit in a gallery. <laughs> so, no, I was, it, actually, it did happen like that, but it, um yeah, I was trying to perform some weird sort of reverse cyclic looping alchemy of turning gold into shit and shit back into gold. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I've, I can read you out a text. I find this one, it, it's quite complex to talk about it. Um, in terms of abjection, I, you know, I think for me the abject is more about connection than repulsion. It's about regaining kind of a connection back into your body and 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 losing the sort of 
sense of separation that the other, you connect with the other, not are repulsed by the other kind of thing. So that it, whether it's the corpse or the shit or it's that, you know, you're one and the same kind of thing. For me anyway, that's the way I would read it. But do you want me to talk about this? I, I'm just curious, conscious of time. It might take too long, I think. Oh, if you, if you just just briefly, if you if you've got um, you know, a minute or so, would be great. Um, so why shit? Shit has a truth to it as matter, a truth, not singular, a sort of universal truth that defies the idea of truth or universe. Versal, universal, universality as pure. Shit is base matter. The matter that falls to the ground, the con, the con, that connects us to ground, that renders us all into a tube or a channel, or somehow hollow by its presence and, and passage through it, us as an object, our first creation or gift that hits the air, that is almost part of us, has been part of us, a fetish object, a relic, an erratic object, and it's sort of a um, you know we shit together as children and as soldiers in a state of exception, but rarely at any other time. So, you know, and our shame begins as the architecture around our shit looms divides and flushes into elaborate systems of sewerage, pathologies, psychologies, and economies of profit and loss. And then I, you know, I blah, blah on a bit. And then, um, you know, it's kind of, can we reimagine our consumption if we can reimagine our waste and, if as Catholics, because, you know, once a Catholic, always a Catholic, I grew up Catholic, um, we believe we can eat Christ at communion, not as a representation, but as a true magical transubstantiated Christ, then can we not shit Christ? So th these are the sort of ideas I was thinking of with that. And, um, yeah. That's a very rushed. <laughs> it's a very, it's a very kind of complicated idea. It was so simple. It was really simple. It started off really simple, and it got really complicated as as it went on. It got argued in Parliament by Erica Betts as a waste of taxpayers' money, which was really funny because I felt like it was successful then as an alchemical process. It became you know, monetary value then as it oh, even... Yeah, as you, know, you know you've made it when Erica Betts is... <laughs> That's right. ...wanting to talk about your work. Um, we've got a question from the audience um, talking about, in particular, the the distinctive names of Sarah's work um, and the sort of, you know, the humour that's inherent in her titling, which is often part of, of the joke, um, you know, such as the work that we've acquired into the National Collection called Titter Pussy Dad, but there are other works in this show called Sugar, Alice Cooper, Oops, Doris La La La, um, and text has been a really important part of that throughout her practice. Um, I don't know, Emma, did you, have you, how have you related to the titles of her works and how they influence your reading? Um, I they're obviously really important um, and um, they just add um, they just add another layer to um, so I'm just thinking about the show that she did in the British Pavilion which was Ice Cream Daddio and um, you know she obviously loved the fact that ice cream was embedded in that title um, so just um, I suppose just looking at every part of the artwork, including the title, as a vehicle for play um, and um, mirroring and, and all of which is going on actually in the work. Um, but like I say, with a very light touch and you know that if you tried to pin her down to say, well, what does that mean? You, you'd already have not got the point if you see what I mean <laughs> it has to it has to live in an area in your brain that is constantly revolving and changing its opinion about what that means Natalia the titles of your works are really interesting as well perhaps not quite as uh one-liner as some of Sarah's but um particularly you know the recent de Kooning the works that reference de Kooning, um, but then refer to other women in your life. Could you talk a bit about the importance of titles when, when you know, when a work resolves and how you come to a title? I used to just be so bad 
with it. Like everything was unto- untitled and it was an archival nightmare. Um, and now I've realised it just so, it sets a tone. Um, it, it's just so important in setting the tone. So um, I try to be a lot more specific now. Um, with the woman paintings, they were difficult women that I had encountered. So one was Pam from the Gold Coast who ran this hotel and had like the most amazing leather skin I've ever seen. And then another was like a difficult family member. I just think um, as far as making it funny or absurd or or showing an audience uh, how seriously you take it or leading them in a particular direction, it's quite important. So I now try not to do any untitles. I've let it, I've let that go. <laughs> I'm reformed. <laughs> a reformed untitler, that's great. Exactly. Yeah, I think there's, there's time for one, uh, one more question before we have to wrap up for this evening. Um, and it asked the, the curators and us artists on the panel, but I'm actually just interested in what the artists have to say. Um, to Is there work you have to do as an artist to make sure audiences get the work? Um, is that something that you consider or that interests you? Michaela, maybe we'll start with you. Uh, yeah. No, I just go back to what Emma was saying, which I think was just so bang on, is just that thing that you've got to activate. It's like the magic of, um, I don't know, you said it so well, Emma, just this thing of this kind of con- setting up a conundrum. It's not about understanding. It's about um, something beyond that. Um, it's not about getting something. It's about just opening up I guess, thinking and feeling and all sorts of things. But, yeah, like, it, I, yes, it, yeah, definitely not about make. I, I hate to think of um, people actually getting it. I think it was a massive failure if that was the case. I'm only, I'm only discounting you and I, Emma, because our entire job is to make people, help people understand <laughs> works. Well, um, I suppose, but also, you know, ideally help people to understand about the wonderfulness of ambiguity as well, you know. And not knowing. You don't have to love art. Yeah. You can you can experience it without having to understand it, I think. It can open things up about all sorts of things, I think. And be sad one thing that you put in there and then the audience that that sounds sad. And that, for me, that's the power of art, right, to have multiple possible meanings at the same time. Um, and that's what makes it so extraordinary and why I keep coming back. And on that note, I think I'm getting the bell and we need to finish up. But I would like to, if this was an in real life event, I would ask for a huge round of applause for all of our panellists. So if you're at home, a little clap would be not go astray. But thank you, Emma. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you, Natalia. This has been a fantastic conversation. And... Thank you to the tech team here and the events team for making this all happen. There's more tech wizardry than you could imagine to get this all to function from one side of the planet to the other. Um, And thank you, finally, to everyone who joined us tonight. It's been uh, a really fantastic conversation, and I hope you've uh, you've enjoyed it and that we see you at the gallery soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.